All right, hi everyone. Um, so I think half the audience, thank you. I think half the audience here is thinking, oh my God, Airbnb, <clears throat> this is fantastic. I love Airbnb, I use them all the time. And you know, this being Washington, uh, information uptake here can be a little bit slow. Some of you are probably thinking, okay, what exactly is Airbnb? So let's begin with that. Nathan, what is Airbnb? On Airbnb, you can find half a million homes around the world offered by regular individuals like you or I, or <laughs> you or I, and um, you can actually stay in their homes by the night, whether it's an extra bedroom or renting the entire home. Uh, it's a way of having a more local experience. So the origin story of Airbnb is so fascinating, and the way it goes is that Airbnb would not exist if it weren't for John McCain, Barack Obama, and cereal boxes. This is, more. this is a funny story. So the, the founding story goes that in October 2007, uh, the three of us who eventually started the company together were just roommates. And at the time, my two partners decided to quit their jobs to become entrepreneurs, um, also known as unemployed. And at the same time, the rent on our apartment was raised, 25%. And I decided to move out, and the other two guys now didn't have enough money to pay for the apartment. And so they're both designers, and they saw that a design conference was coming to San Francisco the following weekend. And they decided, why don't we rent out that extra room we have to designers who need a place to stay? They saw that all the hotels were sold out. Um, well, this room was empty, so there's no furniture, uh, but Joe had some air beds. So instead of calling it a bed and breakfast, they called it an air bed and breakfast, hence the name today, Airbnb. And uh, they were expecting guys like themselves, 25-year-old men, and instead there was a 35-year-old woman from Boston, a father of four from Utah, and a man from India who stayed with them. And not only did they make $1,000 that weekend, but they made great friendships, they went to the conference together, it was a great experience. So based on that, we thought to ourselves, why don't we make a site to do this for other people, other situations? Why don't we make it just as easy to stay in someone's home as it is to stay in a hotel? So that was the idea. Uh, that we eventually launched in August of 2008. And we launched at the Democratic National Convention uh, in Denver. Uh, it was a historical event, and we saw that 80,000 people were gonna attend uh, uh, Obama's uh, uh, nomination, and that there were only 17,000 hotel rooms uh, in Denver. So we said, this is the perfect opportunity for an alternative uh, lodging solution. Uh, and indeed, we, we launched there, and you know, it went really well, we had a lot of people use the site, we had 800 rooms available. Uh, but after the event was over, we were no longer relevant, nobody cared, and that year was very difficult for us. Uh, we went to raise money and no investor would give us money. This is surely this is not a big idea, this is actually a very strange idea. So we were at the end of the year getting into desperate times, this is now around November, right, when the elections are coming up. and. We said, well, our name at the time, Air Bed and Breakfast, we've really focused on the accommodation bit, but what about the breakfast bit? And we got this outlandish idea that we were gonna make a breakfast cereal called Obama O's and Captain McCain's. Uh, and my partners, being designers, created wonderful artwork. They actually physically produced these boxes. They had a printer, print off 500 boxes. We stuffed them with real cereal, and we mailed them to all the reporters that we had met uh, over in Denver for the, uh, for the, for the event there. And when reporters got these boxes, they were just so taken aback, they're like, we have to do a story about this because there's so much hysteria leading up to the election and people are doing these crazy, crazy, like, you know, what's, what's happening, uh, crazy stories. So they were on Good Morning America, then they were on CNN. Uh, and the day we were on CNN, we were the number one CNN political video of the day. And we were separately selling the remainder of the cereal boxes on our website for $40 a box. So that day, we sold uh, a box of cereal every three minutes. We made $30,000, we sold out, and that basically funded our company for the first year before we could raise uh, <laughs> investor money. So that's why we're thankful to those two. Right, so now five years later, how big is Airbnb today? So it's been five years, and it took four years to service our first four million guests, but over the last nine months, we've done five million more. So nine million over five years, but five million in nine months alone. So tremendous exponential growth. We now have half a million properties around the world. Um, that's 192 countries, 40,000 cities. Basically anyone, anywhere can sign up and list their space, whatever it is. It could be a room, a house. They describe what they're offering, they set the price and the availability. And 
150,000 people are staying on our accommodations every single night. How many castles? There's actually 600 castles on our site in Where? 40 countries. A lot of them are in Europe, not so many in the States. That's too bad. Um, so people say that uh, software is eating the world and that mobile is eating the world. These are tech writers. Everything is eating everything. You know, they're very hungry. They also say that Airbnb is eating hotels. Is that the right way to think about how your company is moving into the sort of legacy industries that, that we're sort of used to? No, I, I don't think we're eating hotels. Uh, if you look at hotel data, occupancy rates for hotels are at all-time highs. So our success is not coming at, at their expense. Um, what we're doing is giving consumers another choice. Uh, it's a choice to have a more local, authentic experience. And a lot of people are, are enjoying this. Uh, we're finding that people are able to stay longer when they stay on Airbnb because oftentimes the price is lower. Uh, we also see novel use cases. So we have properties in basically any neighbor, neighborhood in any city. And when people are relocating, oftentimes now, before getting into a one-year commitment, they'll shop around and they'll stay one week in each neighborhood, get a feel for it. And so this is a use case that would never have been possible if you were staying in a hotel. Right. Uh, so the CEO of, of Uber spoke here yesterday. And you know, to me, it's interesting because people don't necessarily think of Uber as a phone company. It's, it's a car company. It's a, it's a taxi replacement. Um, but it wouldn't be possible without mobile technology. Airbnb existed before you had this sort, this you know, influx of of, uh, and of penetration with mobile devices. But still, you guys think you and the other co-founders think that mobile could transform Airbnb itself. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, more and more, you're seeing services that bridge the online world with the offline world. Meaning, it's online software, but it's influencing what happens in the offline world. And imagine Uber if every driver had to go home and check their computer to get, figure out where their next ride was. It wouldn't work, right? Um, Airbnb is, is similar. The more we can put mobile into people's pockets such that they can respond faster to reservation requests and messages, the, the, the faster the transactions uh, will move, the lower the latency will be. When our hosts are on mobile, it makes the experience better for all those people who are not even on mobile, right? And so it makes the whole network stronger. Today, 50% of our hosts are, are actively using the mobile device. It was only 25% at the beginning of the year. And in 2014, we're really pushing for 100%. Another place where online and offline meet is, is government and policy. And you know, there are people who want to share their rooms, and then there are laws that say, no, you may not share your room. In particular, the most famous example, I think, is New York, where there are people using Airbnb, but it's not altogether clear that they are following the letter of the law. Can you talk through how you guys see the challenge in New York, what this law is that's in your way, and how you're going to, to push through and allow people to use the service that they just want to use? Right. So uh, again, the growth has been really astounding. Uh, th we've done more business in nine months than we did in the previous four years. And this has taken a lot of cities by surprise, right? They, they, didn't he they hadn't heard about us, and suddenly we're this really big deal. Um, and we don't fit inside the box. Uh, historically, there's been two kinds of entities. There's been people and businesses and rules for each. And suddenly, there's a new class, a third class, which is people as businesses. Uh, well, they're almost basically micro entrepreneurs. They're doing this part time, and technology is empowering them to, to do these new things, whether it's rent out their extra room, or uh, share a ride, or take care of someone's dog. These are all thriving businesses now that are happening at scale. So uh, in New York, the situation is that the attorney general uh, has suddenly heard about this and got concerned that, okay, if so much of this is happening, where's the tax revenue from this? Um, and has taken a very traditional approach of saying, let me figure this out for myself. Give me all your data on all your users, and I'm gonna pick out a few examples to make an example of and teach the rest a lesson. And what we've said is we actually believe our users should pay taxes too. Um, the reason they're not paying taxes is because if they get the tax paperwork and they look at it, it asks questions like, what is your hotel name? What is your business license? And, and these are regular, everyday people renting out their extra bedroom, sometimes their entire homes, but they're primary residents. They're not, they're not businesses in the traditional sense. So they're hitting a dead end. And what we would like to do is partner with cities and say, here's the obstacle, but let's think about what the solution could be. Because there is a solution here that would generate tax revenue for cities um, and address other concerns like neighbors, um, and safety, et cetera. Uh, meanwhile, there's 
a huge benefit to be had for cities as well. So we've done these economic impact studies. And in New York, for example, over the last 12 months, we've brought 630 million in tourist spending to New York. Now, 200 million of that went directly to our hosts. 400 million was spent on shopping and restaurants. What's interesting is that 87% of our properties are outside of the traditional hotel districts in, in New York. They're spread evenly through the city. And so this money is being spent in neighborhoods that don't normally see the benefit of tourism. Tourism is one of the huge drivers of the economy. So Brooklyn, for example, made $89 million over the last year because of Airbnb. That's huge for the economy and something I think cities have a lot of interest in. Right, I mean, not to, not to repeatedly compare you to Uber, but just to connect it for the audience, a lot of whom saw uh, their CEO talk yesterday. You know, what he was saying was that there are people who can't afford taxis, but then Lyft comes along and UberX comes along and it democratizes the ride sharing and transportation process. And to a certain extent, what I suppose you could say to these cities is we're democratizing the accommodation process. There are hotels in New York. I, I live in New York. They're ungodly expensive. Um, uh, well, I guess I don't say them in anymore since I now live there. But they're too expensive. But you, people can come to New York now that they can stay with people because they're setting different prices. Is that, is that a, a, at the heart of your argument to the city and to the state? Absolutely. We believe we're bringing more people to New York. We're allowing them to stay longer because it's more affordable. We're also giving them a more authentic experience. We've s surveyed our users and they are more likely to come back to New York or to any city they visit using Airbnb because of the impression they're left with. Um, so I, I think we're bringing more tourism. Uh, we're directing those dollars into local businesses that keep it in the economy instead of having it pumped out uh, to a multinational corporation. Um, it's going to people who are most in need. Our, Hosts are uh, below the median income overall. A lot of them are artists, uh, freelancers, unemployed. They're people who could, might have lost their home had it not been for, for the Airbnb option. So we're basically giving tools that anyone who has a need can use. Um, and I think that's actually really noteworthy because technology is creating a lot of new opportunities for people, but it's for people who have certain skills, right? It's a younger demographic, it's a, a certain degree. Uh, and here's something that anybody who has a home uh, and a sense of hospitality uh, can generate additional income to pay for a mortgage, uh, medical expenses, uh, and, and have a sense of self-empowerment. I have a sense that you know, the audience at this point is sort of divided into three groups. One that knew Airbnb is and, is and is excited to hear about the business behind their experience. One that's uh, being transformed into an Airbnb fan, thinking this sounds like a really cool idea. I can't wait to stay in that castle in, in France that you guys accommodate. And then a third that's, that might be thinking, as some of my friends do, especially my older friends, this is, this is crazy. People are letting strangers stay in their bedrooms and they're giving them rides and accepting money for it, and they don't know each other. Because underpinning this entire sharing economy is this, this trust economy that simply says, trust me because I'm on Facebook. I mean, un <laughs> unpack this. It, it, right. To a certain extent, it is almost that simple, it seems, but why does it work? Right. Well, just remember, five years ago, everyone thought this was crazy, and now 150,000 people are doing this every single night. Um, but I understand there's still a lot of skeptics in the audience. Uh, the fundamental thing we did in the beginning was we facilitated the transaction, meaning we handled the money, um, but also both guests and hosts accrue reviews and reputation after the process. So after you stay with someone, as a guest, you review the host, and the host reviews you, and these reviews can only be left by paying customers. Um, as a result, many of our properties have dozens and dozens of reviews by people who actually stayed there. So if you actually go to the site and you read these reviews, you'll start to build a lot of confidence that what you see here is what you're gonna get, that your expectations are set right. And furthermore, when you pay to book, you pay Airbnb, we hold your money until after you arrive. That way, if you need to cancel or something's not as described, you just call our 24 seven customer support line, we can give you your money right back. Meanwhile, the host knows they have to follow through on what was promised in order to get paid. So it aligns incentives very nicely, um, and, and as a result, it works. The last question I have, and we have uh, one minute and eight uh, seconds left, is a macroeconomic question. I was out in, La in Los Angeles and I was using Lyft. Lyft is a ride-sharing program. Uh, someone who owns a car picks you up, you get in the front seat, you fist pound them and they uh, drive you to wherever you want and you pay them. Um, and they were saying they make, sh they, sh they were sort of marginally employed. They're making most of their money from uh, Lyft and from Airbnb. 
do you guys see yourself as part of this almost shadow economy that exists, where people that are finding it hard to work in the formal economy are finding an informal peer-to-peer -peer economy and making a living that way? Are you seeing that? Absolutely. There's a lot of people who are unemployed or underemployed, and now there's a group of services that allow you to an, an additional option, right? And I, I've talked to Lyft drivers as well, and they tell me, I drive people around because I can wake up whenever I want and go to work and get off duty whenever I want, and I enjoy talking to people, and I make money while doing it. Uh, for Airbnb hosts, it's extra income, but it's also a way to travel the world without ever leaving your home. People love taking in people from around the world. Real friendships are formed, there's a connection, and it also gives people a sense of purpose. Um, part of being an entrepreneur is like, it's just so great to run your own business, that feeling you get. And we are allowing everyday people to have that feeling uh, in, a, in a, a smaller way. Nathan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.